Here we go. I am Michael Merlo. I am with John Michael Masiri. JM, episode 61. How are you doing today? I almost thought that you were going to forget that. The little last part. Yes, no, about. I... Good job, Bob. I did. I uh, did, but I was like... You did. That. It's a good on. recovery, Michael. Uh, I'm doing good, man. Today feels like a Friday, by the way. You're going just walking yes. around thinking it's Friday, but it's Thursday. Uh, weather, hot today. I mean, windows down... I was cruising. Smells AC like summer. on. AC? You put AC on today? AC, AC was on. Nah, and the gas mileage just, definitely went down with the AC on. Let's roll the window down, man. It's not that hot. No, it was that hot. It was, it was 77 degrees in my car. I was sweating in a short shorts and a t-shirt. I think that's a you problem. Yeah, it probably is. I need the AC, though. All right. Well, it, besides it besides, feel besides like... that, how are you, Michael? I don't really. You, you oh. always ask me how I am. How are you? I know you never ask me how I am. Mm-hmm. I am fantastic. I've seen the Mets play three times now on the road. Very exciting, and I cannot wait for the home opener, which is Friday tomorrow. Uh, that's my day. My whole day tomorrow is dedicated to the Mets home opener. So this feels like a Friday for me. Commitment. Yes, Thank a lot of commitment. commitment. Yeah, I'm going to the Yankee game. Uh... April 22nd, next Friday. That'll be my first game of the year. Looking against the Guardians. To against the Guardians, yep. Looking forward to first it. Time, first time seeing the Guardians. And not first the time seeing the Guardians. I'm not sure who's on the mound for them. but uh, No, you won't know for, won't know for a, a couple little while. Don't maybe, you'll see, maybe you'll get to see your boy Shane Biebs. That, that would be nice. That is hot. Although, don't and really want to see my team face Shane Biebs kind of a thing. Right. I feel that. Although you're scared and you don't want a good opponents. So actually you're soft. So I don't feel that. I'd always root to see Max Scherz or Jacob Jerome if I was going to see Mets Nationals. I, I really hope that we don't get Stephen Kwan. Th- that story is crazy. I mean, I, I wasn't even going to bring that up. I don't know much about him. Can you explain anything? I mean, it's an, it's I don't know his backstory and everything like that, but no, 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 just like what he's doing. Just explain I mean, what yeah, he's, he's, doing. he's I really can't hitting the crap you. out of the ball. He's batting like four fifty, but uh, this is Yerman Mercedes two point oh. Let's not start calling you know Stephen Kwan the the second coming of Jesus Christ. Wasn't there a stretch where he didn't swing and miss? Like he had like a few games where he just he was either fouling the ball off or he would put it in play or get a hit. I'm not sure. He never honestly. swung a mess. I almost positive I'm correct. I've never heard of this guy. He's 24 years old. He's a rookie. He's batting 526. Uh, he's 10 for 19. Eight walks. Leads the MLB in, in walks. That's impressive. No homers, though. Maybe he's not the next uh, Steven. I mean, Yerman Mercedes. Steven. Yeah. Good. Who knows, man? What did I say? You said Steve. Wow, Otani. I know, but I, I, I caught myself. The Otani is getting rocked. I mean, where he got rocked. I saw he gave up four runs in, oh, God, what inning was it? In the second. And it's 10-2 Rangers right now to drive around the, the majors right there. Let's see how many runs he gave up today. He gave up six runs in three and two-thirds today. He's got a 70 all right. I think we kind of overrated Otani a little bit as a pitcher. I'm not going to lie to you. Listen, relax. Relax. Little Second little start little of the year. Second start of the year. Little bit. You Just in general. Not even... people. You see Jose Barrios, his first start of the year, got one out and gave up like six runs. So That's my Cy Young pick. Tom yourself. That's my Cy Young pick. Do not talk crap about him. All right. We're going to get to the Blue Jays in a minute. Let's let's get on track here. I do want to bring up, we're going to talk pitching right now because we're going to talk about Clayton Kershaw. Uh, Wednesday afternoon in Minnesota, he was pitching a perfect game, 80 pitches in a, through seven, and Dave Roberts pulls him. And this was, you know, has been widely talked about for the last 24 hours now, and I think it will continue to be talked about. This was Kershaw's first start of the season. Um, he, he came to the team a little late. He did throw in a sim game last week where he only got up to 75 pitches. The goal was to get him around five to six innings, 60 to 70 pitches. He ended up pushing him to seven perfect innings, 80 pitches. Dave Roberts pulls him too early in the season. What do you think? I'll let you start off. 
I mean, I understand fully the whole pitch count and everything like that. I mean, every team is doing that, and they've been doing that for years. Um, then if it was a no hitter, I'd be fine with it. Perfect game though, and like this is Kershaw. This isn't some like rookie, and he's you know he has he's never pitched a, a lot of innings before. Like Kershaw has been here for a while. He knows what he's doing. He knows how to take care of himself. Let it ride. I mean, a perfect game. There's been, there's been only 21 was the number. Perfect 23, games. 23, I think. 23 perfect games in MLB history. Uh, that's something pretty special. And he had two more innings to go. You got to let it let it ride. And then if he gives up a hit, then yank him right away. But I understand that it's history and it's it's so rare. I saw Jeff Passon's tweet that went around. There's, you know, there's been more than 223 thousand baseball games played only 23 have ended in a, in a perfect game i understand that but we have to realize that the dodgers yeah, baseball's a business unfortunately and the dodgers care about winning a championship and kershaw's dealt with injuries and it's the smart move to make if you're a team and your main goal is to win a world series you're gonna need him they have question marks you know surrounding a couple of starting pitchers they don't know when they're gonna get dustin may back uh, Trevor Bauer's futures in the air. So they're going to rely on Clayton Kershaw this season and they cannot have him, you know, for whatever reason, it, it's 36 degrees in Minnesota. They can't have him get hurt. So I, I love history as much as you do. I can't stand some of these rest days. I can't stand pulling starters. I cannot stand bullpen games or relievers coming in for starters after four or five innings. I can't take it, but I think this was the right move. I don't, I mean, listen, I get it. I get wanting to take care of your guys. And this is a team that's going to be competing for a world series and everything like that. But we're not talking about 120 pitches and, you know, letting them get to 150. I mean, I understand it's early in the season and these guys aren't used to throwing a hundred plus pitches, but only 80 pitches for a guy that's been in the league for over 10 years and has, you know, 2000 innings on on him already or whatever he has i don't think it would have been a big deal to leave him in the game i get why they did it um it just it sucks i mean i you would love to see him go out there and go for the perfect game we've seen guys in the past though go deeper into these games whether it's early on you know, go more pitches than they should, and they end up having issues, whether it's, you know, a month from now, whether it's a week from now, whether it's four months from now. You know, I understand you can't predict injuries, but – and we're going to talk about that in one second, you know, injuries and rest days. But I kind of just feel like they had a plan, and this is the smart move to make. And I'm – actually, I may sound like I'm contradicting myself later, but – it kind of seems like the smart move early on in the season. And on top of it, you're on the road. And I said before, it was freezing cold in Minnesota. So he couldn't have felt, I mean, I'm sure he felt good, but not great. The only thing I don't get is I understand Kershaw going out there and defending his manager and saying it was the right move, but he, there's no way he actually genuinely thinks that, or he was okay with him coming out of the game. I mean, there's, the guy's a competitor. He's a professional athlete. There has to have been that fire in him to say, let me go out there and finish this. I mean, this is something special. Not everybody gets an opportunity like this. And uh, and he got pulled. I mean, I know Kershaw's got a no-hitter under his belt, but listen, we see six, seven no-hitters a season at this point. We see a perfect game every five or ten years. So It's been ten years. I think Felix Hernandez was the last one. Scherzer should have had radio it. Yesterday. Scherzer should have yes. had him when Tabata just leaned over the plate. Yep. It's a sticky situation. And, I, you know, I, I think Kershaw, I think Kershaw probably understood why he was being taken out. I'm sure they went over a game plan before the game saying, okay, you know, this is, you know, this is what we're going to do. And he, he understood. And I, I think he's the, again, I under, I agree with you. He's a competitor. Of course he wants to be out there, but he realizes for, you know, the betterment of his health for the rest of the season, it is kind of important if he comes back out there, if he doesn't go back out there, excuse me. It's tough. I, I hate to not see history be made. Do you know it's more rare for a four home run game than a perfect game? Yeah. What are they like 16, 15, four home run games or something like that? Yeah. No, no more than 20 high teens. Forgot the number. And we almost saw one last night. Do you think we will ever see a four home run cycle? Like the home run cycle. 
It was funny. Cespedes had three of them. In and he one game. He, had, he, had, he had like a grand slam, a three-run shot, and then either a solo or a two-run shot in one game. I know when, he, Scooter was, Jeanette, when Scooter Jeanette had his four-home run game, he was one shy. He had like two two-run homers, the grand slam, and a solo shot. Yes. Wait, Scooter Jeanette, somebody that has a four-home run game? You didn't know? Yeah. Come on. I remember this now. I just watched yep. it the other day, oh actually. My God. Him and Mar- I know J.D. Martinez. It might have been the same season. That J.D. Martinez hit it, too. He was. That's when he got traded to the Diamondbacks, J.D. Martinez. Yeah, and he hit, like, 29 home runs in, like, 60 games. He was unbelievable. They went to the yeah. playoffs that year. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, so your team uh, does this many times. Um, many teams do this as well. And, you know, I've heard this debate all day now, you know, whether or not, you know, rest days are good. And we've seen star players, you know, rested early on in this season, just giving them a day here and there. The managers, you know, the trainers, they all say this is good. It'll keep them going the rest of the year. We're trying to prevent injuries. And I see a lot of people upset about it that it's, you know, five, six, seven games into the season and we're already giving guys days off. Um, I don't really have a major problem with it, honestly. I mean, in the past, especially with the Yankees, with the whole Stanton situation, you know, sometimes they get a little happy with rest days. The, the, the part where I have a problem with it, and we talked about it on the show uh, last year, um, last season, when guys are hot and you take them out, that's when I have a problem with it. Because we, right. I mean, we, we had this conversation a bunch of times where the Yankees don't believe in hot right? Um, Aaron Boone went out last year and said that the Yankees had a must-win game, and he benched Aaron Judge and Gio Urshela, who were the two hottest hitters in the lineup at the time. Um, So I understand the rest days. I just wish they were a little less structured and scheduled, and it was more of a just go with the flow, you know, we'll, we'll make the decision when it's time to make the decision kind of a thing, not this guy's 10 for his last 22 and let's rest him today. Let me ask you something. And I, again, I know it's early on it and you, and you said it just now, you know, I I cannot stand that. They don't believe in hot and cold streaks. I think that is complete BS, but whatever. What we've seen this even later in the season. I think you just mentioned this. What about Stanton, you know, yesterday or Wednesday, I should say, Getting an off day, Stanton, DHs plays, you know, uh, how many games did he play in the outfield this year before tonight? One or two, maybe? Oh, yeah. He's been DHing. What's with him getting an off day against, you know, one of the better teams in baseball, the Blue Jays, you know, this early on? You can't sit him this weekend against the Orioles on the road? You can't yeah. do that? Yeah, I get it. I mean, listen, I think the Yankees, they're in a little bit of a different situation this year because they're you're going to have one guy on the bench every night that is a starting caliber player. Um, you know, we've seen Donaldson on the bench. We've seen Stanton on the bench, Glaber, uh, DJ Hicks. So I get it. Maybe, you know, wait for, for the Orioles series, but who knows? We might have an Aaron judge rest day coming. We might have a Joey Gallo rest day coming. I don't know what else they have planned, but uh, it's early on in the season. Uh, I don't know what Stanton's splits were against um, Berrios, Berrios in his career. I don't think they were very good. Yeah. But uh, like I said, I, I the, the whole no, they don't believe in hot thing makes no sense to me because Aaron Moon's a former player. There's former players all around the game and around the organization. You can't tell me that as a former player that you don't believe in hot or cold. Anybody who's ever played baseball in their life before knows what it's like to be hot or cold. You go up to the plate, you have no confidence. It's, it's like you're trying to swing and the ball looks like it's the size of a penny. And then you have those moments when you're you're on fire and it looks like you're swinging at a beach ball. So they can't that that just seems to me like a lazy excuse and they don't really have anything else to come up for for benching these guys. So that's how they explain it. But there's no way they don't believe in hot and cold, especially Boone. I mean, we've talked about it before and you just said it. He's a former player. Yeah. Like, come on. I, I know exactly the feeling. I used to be a star baseball player myself. And, yeah. and listen. I understand yeah. early on right now, especially with the pitchers. I, I, I do. I, I get it with the pitchers now. It was a shortened spring training. You don't want them to go so many innings, so many pitches. I understand that. For the first start or two, you're going to be a little cautious. You know, what did Cole come out with 80 pitches yesterday mm-hmm. on, on Wednesday night against the Blue Jays? So, yeah, 
of course it's you know it, it's it's not easy to manage these pitchers you know max scherzer went you know had struggled early on through 30 pitches in the first inning got through five had 90 something pitches and that was it you know if this was a big game later on in the year and he was at 92 pitches you know he might be going out there for the sixth inning but it's early on and these managers being cautious and i get that with the pitchers but maybe not so much with with these uh with these position players yet I, you know i'm not i'm not 100 percent there yet I mean, it depends on the position player. It depends on how they're performing and, and who they're going against and whatnot. I think, like I said, the Yankees have a very talented roster where they can afford to rest one of these guys and not uh, not lose sleep over it. But, you know, when I remember Gleyber Torres in 2018, 2019, whatever it was, when he was playing really well, they would just rest him, you know. And he's a young guy, healthy guy, didn't really have any injury history, 22 years old at the time, didn't make sense just resting him when he's swinging a hot bat and uh, you know, he, he wasn't tired or whatever. Um, but for a guy like Stanton, it's a little different. I mean, we know the injury history with Stanton and this is a team that really needs him and is trying to compete for a world series. And he's been their most clutch hitter, especially in the postseason. So keeping him fresh and giving him a couple off days in April, I- I'm not going to gonna cry about that. All right. I'm sure they cry about something else. Uh, we saw some baseball teams crying, or really one in particular crying uh, this past week, and that was the San Diego Padres and Bob Melvin. They were crying because they were down nine in San Francisco in the sixth inning, and one of the players on the Giants decided to bunt. You know, he wanted to get on base, and he bunted right down the left field, uh, right down the third baseline. He got on base pretty pretty easily. Did, would he beat it out? Yeah, he beat it yeah, out. He did. Right? Yep, yep. Yeah, he beat it out. He got a hit. Yep. I'm I'm vi- envisioning him walking back to the dugout. I'm like, mm-hmm. he beat it out. Yeah. He's standing on first base, and Bob Melvin was pissed, and the Padres were pissed. And guess what, Bob Melvin? I don't feel bad for you. You were losing by nine runs, okay? And there is no mercy rule in baseball. There's no. Oh, you have to stop playing. No clock. Yeah. There's, yeah. Wh- why? And I heard a fantastic point on this. You know, there's the obvious points. You know, it's only the sixth inning. It's nine runs. Teams can come back. I get that. What about this? What about the fact that you want to go through their bullpen, the team's bullpen so much, so that they're not going to be able to use guys they may want to use the next day? How about that? You, if you just lay down and, you know, whatever, don't score any more runs and don't try and, you know, get hits or score runs, then they're going to have a rested bullpen for the next day to try and beat you. You want to try and use those guys. Get everybody out of the arm barn. Yeah, I mean, I think the number one point to make here is this is this is a job for these guys, right? This is not uh, an after school, let's go play baseball for three hours. Like, these guys make a living on this, so – if I'm Mauricio Dubon, I don't care. I'm I'm going to try to get on base, get a hit, raise my average, do whatever, because at the end of the day, I'm trying out for either my team or for a different team to get paid eventually. So I want to put out the best performance I can. I want my stats to be as good as they can. I want to help my team as much as I can. And you're right. There's no clock. This is the sixth inning. We've seen comebacks before, much bigger than that. Um, listen, I think where you can go – the different way and say, oh, you're showing the other team up. If Mauricio Dubon goes out there and rips a three-run shot and bat flips like he just sent the Giants to the World Series, okay, then you could give him a problem for that. That's showing up the other team. That's not classy. That You know, you, you don't need to be doing all that right. other extra stuff. But going out there and laying down a bunt and getting a hit, I mean, come on. We, we go back to the Tatis situation against Texas in 2020, and – you know, he swings at a 3-0 pitch, hits a grand slam into the right center field seats, and the uh, the, the Rangers have a huge problem with it. Like I said, I'm going, there, so soft? I'm going up there. I'm going up there. I'm trying to do the best that I can for my team and for myself. Um, and you want me to sit there at a 3-0 fastball right down the middle when I know it's coming and just take it? I mean, Fernando Tatis has the ability to be one of the greatest players we've ever seen play the game. And he wants to put together an amazing legacy and Hall of Fame resume and everything like that. 
MVP. You know, he, he gets an MVP. He gets an endorsement deal. He gets a bonus from the team, whatever. You're going to tell me, go up there 3-0, look at a 93-mile-an-hour fastball right down the middle? Hell no, I'm swinging away. Guess what? You don't want them to hit. You don't want them to bunt. Play place so that they can't bunt down the line. You don't yeah. want to give up a home run. You don't want them to swing 3-0. Don't throw a meatball right down the middle. That that's what I have to say. And also, let's remember, I know I know that as baseball fans, we have an emotional connection to the game and everything like that. But this is an entertainment business at the end of the day. I mean, yeah. we, you know, baseball wants to see guys still giving their all and hitting bombs. And how about this? How about those teams? Everybody does it. We just saw it the other day. Brett Phillips, you're up, you're up, you're down by nine runs, and you're putting in an outfielder on the mound. He's throwing 48 miles an hour. That's much worse to me than a guy going out there and laying down a bunt single up nine runs. I don't want to see a joke, a guy laughing on the mound, throwing 45 mile an hour ethoses. I mean, that to, that to me is a joke when guys do that. I mean, you're saving your bullpen, but that won't be frowned upon because you're losing and nobody will, will you know, give you a problem about that. But if you're winning and you're going out there and taking big swings and laying down bunts, that's where they draw the line. Yeah, no, you're on. You're 100 correct. And it's funny when Brett Phillips goes out there and the plays he made on um, a couple of days ago, whenever he was pitching, he like made a sliding play near the dugout. It's great. I love how much fun he has with it. But you're right. You know that could be a it could be a not a shining moment for the sport. It's embarrassing almost to watch that. But people love it. But it's I agree with you. Is it's like a double standard that the team I mean, some, losing can do whatever the hell they want, but the team that's winning and up and, and earned the right to do whatever they want up 11 2, they, they got to stop playing. Okay, you're you're stopping, you're stopping your play when you put a pitcher on the mound 100%. Anyway, we'll talk about your Yankees for a little bit and just the ALEs in general. But, um, you know, we were kind of bringing up the Yankees before and how, you know, they may have you know, they have so many players for, you know, so many positions. And it might sound like a good thing, but I, I think I'm going to come on the side, down on the side. I know it's six games and we're in the middle of the seventh, but, and this might sound like an overreaction. I don't know if that's a good thing. I mean... I get what you're saying. You know, you want to get guys consistent at bats and somebody's going to get unhappy at some point, but I, I, I don't know. I think if you're giving your best players the most consistent at bats and you, you get down into Glaber Torres and, and Aaron Hicks and whoever else, I mean, maybe LeMayhew, but he see, he's swinging a really good bat lately. If those guys are getting a little bit less consistent at bats, then so be it. Um, I think having depth is not an issue at all. I think that's, you know, a good thing to have. I get what you're saying. I mean, we saw it with Luke Voigt towards the end of his uh, career with the Yankees. He was upset and he couldn't really get going. Clint Frazier said the same thing. He couldn't get going because of his consistent at-bats, but he's just ass anyways. Um, oh. But, uh, yeah, I get what you're saying. It could be a problem, but – I don't think this is a major problem for them to to be concerned about because I think if there's a lot of problems to have, this is not one that's going to be at the top of people's lists in terms of concern. Do you think that guys, and I'm going to use, you know, the guys that this really affects, do you think it affects guys like DJ LeMayhew or a Glaber Torres or an Aaron Hicks or even, you know, these outfielders where they're not playing, you know, a set position? it's it's going to change day by day. No, you know, somehow Aaron Boone's going to have to come out with a lineup. And, you know, again, like we said, there's going to be some days where, you know, Donaldson's the DH and you've got LeMay at third and, you know, you got Glaber at second. There's going to be days, you know, where Stanton's DHing and it's just, it's all confusing and it all changes each day. Do you think that kind of can have a toll on somebody? I mean, I think so. Uh, I mean, yeah. I, if you're being asked to fill a couple different roles, yes. But let's not act like these guys are, are, you know, you're mentioning Aaron Hicks and Glaber Torres. These are not guys who have played like superstars. I mean, no. Glaber Torres just went out last year, had a, a, a below average offensive season and below average or, or sorry, a below average or average at best offensive season and a below average defensive season. So 
you know, you're not, you're, we're on a contending team here. We're not on the Baltimore Orioles and, you know, let's just go out and, and play baseball and win 60 games. This is a team that has a lot of talent on it. And um, if you're not performing to the best of your abilities, you're going to be asked to move around and fill in some different roles and, and sit on the bench a little bit. So, I mean, they might have a problem with that egotistically, but in terms of just dealing with it, I mean, it is what it is. You, you, it's not like you deserve, if you're Glaber Torres, you deserve to be the everyday second baseman 162 games. You might have to play a little shortstop. You might have to only play 130 games, you know, start 120 games, whatever. It is what it is. How is this fair, like, how is this fair for a guy like DJ, though, that's going to play half his games at second, half his games at third? I don't third. think DJ yeah. has a problem with that, though. I mean, he's he's been asked to fill that role already. He, he even did it when he had his uh, MVP-esque season in 2019. I mean, he played the majority of the games at second base, but he played a little first base, played a, played a little third base. I don't think he's got much of an issue with it. As long as he's in the lineup every day, I really don't see it as a major issue. And now let me ask you one more question. Defensively, right? You want to be you you want to be as you know, best positioned on defense as possible. You know, I'd say Donaldson's probably your better third baseman defensively. You'd say DJ's better at second, obviously, than Glaber. And in, in in the outfield, I don't even know what the best defense – would it be the, you know, the three-headed monster? Yeah, see, would it that's be where Judge, he, Gallo, right. and that, That's Stanton? what you juggle there is – is standing right or Hicks in center, which, which one of those looks is better for the defense. Um, I'd say probably standing right and judging center, just as I think Hicks's defense has really declined. I mean, he's really not a fast player anymore. He never was a speed demon, but I think his speed has even decreased over the past couple of years. And uh, he's really known for that amazing arm, but he's had the injuries and I think he's lost it a little bit. Um, but I think fully healthy, this team is one of the better defensive teams in baseball. They really are. I mean, you go around the diamond, Higashioka is a plus defender. Rizzo is above average. Gold glove, right? DJ is a gold glove at second base. Isaiah Conner for left and won a gold glove at third. He's he's had a little bit of a shaky start, but I think he'll come into his own at short. Uh, Donaldson, another great glove at third. Lost a little bit of it with his age, but still a good defender. Joey Gallo's got a gold glove in left field. Um, and then Judge is a gold glove caliber right fielder. You put him in center, you know, he maybe loses a bit of a touch defensively. And Stanton, a lot of people think that Stanton is, is a lousy defender, but he's actually not. He's an average to a little bit above average of a defender. I mean, he's got a great arm. Uh, the range may not be as good, but he's got a good glove and he's got a great arm. So, uh, and especially playing right field in Yankee Stadium, you don't have a lot of, a lot of ground to carry, uh, to, to cover. Yeah. Um, see, I, I agree everywhere, but shortstop, I, I don't feel great about that. I don't feel great about IKF. I think he'll be, and obviously, be and you. obviously offensively, it's been very, very difficult for him to start this season. Yeah. I don't know. I'm not hitting a panic button on the Yankees, but I think they got to figure this out. I think that lineup that we kind of just put out there, just excluding Hicks and maybe DHing you know, Glaber, I, I kind of feel like that's the better lineup or the I best think, possible lineup. Yeah. I mean, listen, I, I hate to say it as a fan, but somebody's going to get hurt too. Yeah. You know, somebody's going to be able to step up and fill in a role and be an everyday player for a month or however long. I mean, hopefully there's no serious injuries, but it always happens. I mean, you look at the lineup from last year and years past, you know, Andrew Velasquez comes up and fills in a role. Tim LaCastro, before he was hurt, was filling in a role for the Yankees, you know, dealing with injuries. So everybody's got those guys that come and fill in, and uh, they'll have to avoid that step by by one when they have a Glaber or a Hicks or, or a DJ or whoever to fill in for an injured player. What did you think of Vlad last night or Wednesday night? What do I think of Vlad? I think – I don't want to play this guy for the next 15 to 20 years. You've handled him so far nine. No. Yeah. I mean, Severino struck him out three times. Um, but I, I actually had a little interaction with a couple of my friends complaining about Garrett Cole or whatever that, you know, he gave up the two run shot to Vlad, the second home run that Vlad hit. And I said to them, I was like, guys, 
I know Cole, you know, he, he's not off to a great start, but I don't care who's on the mound. That's not Garrett Cole's fault. That's just Vlad Guerrero. I mean, Cole tipped his cap. That's just Vlad Guerrero being an otherworldly hitter. First pitch Most, fast, both times. First pitch, well, uh, the second home ball, run on the hands. The second home run. And then the double. Yeah. The yeah, second home run was nothing, insane. Yeah. 98 miles an hour in on the hands, basically going over the chalk on the batter's box, and he pulls it into the left field bullpen. That's just the first home run he had made a mistake. It was a hanger. He admitted yeah. that. Boone admitted it. That second home run is not there's nothing you can do. No. There's nothing you can do. I mean, you could throw an off speed other than do what he did. Pitch. That's really it. And that double, the double he hit down the line. It's like holy okay. He literally tipped his cap after the double. He's yeah. Like, yeah. You're like, all right, okay. we can't get this guy out. Whatever. You know what I think Cole's pro you know what I think one of the issues with, with Cole is. Honest to God, not to boast myself or my team. You look at Jacob DeGrom and what he's done when he's on the mound, and he puts up zeros. I mean, there's very rarely where he has a start where he gives up three runs or more. It's very, very rare. And just watching that is so rare. So you sign this guy, and you expect him to be a race, and you expect him to pitch in big games, and he pitched in big games in 2020, and he was great for them in that postseason. But – because he's being compared to DeGrom, who is doing things we really haven't seen before in a very long time, it doesn't look as good. But meanwhile, if you look at – if you really watched Cole last night, he was pretty good. He was better than his numbers told you. Yeah, I mean, he's got some wrinkles to to iron out, but we can't go out there and expect this guy to give you seven innings of zero, one-run ball every single night. I mean, he's going to have his bad starts, and he's off to a slow start this year. I don't know. A lot of Yankee fans still have that bad taste in their mouth from the wild card game and, and Cole struggling against the Red Sox down the stretch last year. But the guy's a great pitcher. You got to give him a little bit of time. Um, he, he is an ace. He's supposed to be an ace. He's not going to go out there and dominate every single night. He's going to have his eight innings, 15 strikeouts, his complete games. And he's also going to have his three innings, five runs. You know, it's, it's, he's not a robot. I think Cole sometimes, I think what happens to him is he lets his emotions get the best of him and he's just like a lunatic and he's got all this energy and he's over pumped and whatever. And he's also, a, he's got that perfectionist thing going on. So I think he gets his, in his own head a little bit, but I'm happy to have him on the team and I think we're lucky to have him. And I think he'll be great for us in the years to come. As somebody that looks from afar, he seems like an unlikable guy. You think so? Like yeah. within the clubhouse? Um, I don't know about within the clubhouse because I can't tell what he's like in the clubhouse. But I kind of confirmed it last night when I was watching an interview. And, you know, he's giving – it's funny because he's giving praise, giving praise to Vlad. I'm like, oh, that's nice. But he seems – he, he kind of seems like he's that perfectionist. Well, he is what you said. He's a perfectionist. I agree with you. And it almost comes across as if he's whining. Like, I, I don't know. It's a, it's a weird thing. I just, I don't know. Right. Not a huge fan of his personality. I'm not. Yeah. I mean, I think he makes some, some weird comments sometimes. And uh, I don't know. He, he is, you know, what's something about him too. The way he acts in the, the lock in the clubhouse and in the dugout and everything like that. I think back to that, that Yankees Mets game, that nine 11 series last year with the Lindor situation with his three home run night and Stanton hit the home run. And they had a little, yeah. they talked to each other, or whatever. And you saw Cole on the top step, like going crazy and like yelling at Lindor. And today Luis Severino hit Lourdes Gurriel jr. Uh, up and in with a fastball. And uh, Luis uh, said to Alec Manoa on the bench, he said, and you got something to say to me, whatever, just bantering back and forth. And Cole's the first guy over the rail, walking around the warning track uh, by the dugout, kind of just pacing around, like ready to, looks like he's ready to fight. So I think, I like that. I think he, I like it too, but it's not, I think he's kind of a lunatic, to be honest with you. I really like it. I think he's a little crazy. And you know what it, all, it also could be, my, my thing with him? It could be just, a, you know, how he comes across with the media. Some guys just bad with the media. So when you see him That's in an interview, true. he doesn't sound, sound likable, but he may be the greatest teammate. I don't know. I'm not in that clubhouse. So I, yeah. That's why I can't give a definitive answer. 
But when he's with the media, I just I, I can't. I don't. Know, I, I don't like. I, him. I do. Th- I, I do. Scherzer came across likable. I do think he's me. bad with the media. Honestly, I mean, you have we've had a couple instances. You know, this year already when he was talking about he wasn't ready for the game or he was ready to go and there was a delay because oh my god or whatever. Um, and then last year, the whole spider tax situation, I mean, he gave a pretty brutal answer when he was saying, you know, it's so hard to grip the ball and blah, blah, blah. I mean, he was basically whining to the media, but, um, some guys might just be bad with the media. Uh, that is what Definitely it is. possible. Maybe he's got emotional damage from being, uh, teammates with Trevor Bauer in college, because I know that, I know that they despised each other. They, he, I think it was more of just um, Cole hating Bauer. Cole hating Bauer. Yeah. Well, you actually look at, look at Trevor be... Bauer's whole backstory. He's hated wherever he's gone by front offices, by managers, teammates, everybody. We got a blank stare on your face. Because you just, I didn't even realize you just said something because you just completely laid out. Oh. Well, it probably came up on mine, so we're fine. I thought you were. I didn't even hear what you said. I All I heard was we were talking about Cole and Bauer. Um, I think it's a good thing, though. I think that's a good trait that Cole did not like Bauer. Yeah. Good sign. That, that was a smart thing. He did like him. Apparently like nobody him. liked him. Oh, Apparently yeah. nobody liked him. That's what I just said. I said that the, the, the front offices and managers and whoever he's been involved with over his career have not liked him. I mean, he's been scrutinized everywhere yes. he's gone. No, that um, that makes a ton of sense. And oh my one God. more thing. One. Look at this. Just looks horrible. This guy said, "Chicken parm for dinner." Rizzo, Rizzo and Gallo better show out. Look at it. the focusing. That guy needs to learn how to cook better. Yeah, I, no, I see it. I'm, horrendous. Unfortunately, I see it. That is, what is that, zucchini that is disgusting. Or cucumbers. Let me say, I didn't even see the zucchini, the cucumbers. Oh, here we go. The focus in. Oh, I can't tell you. I can't tell you. I mean, when we, you got to put the sauce on and the cheese and then put it back in the oven for a good 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Right, maybe longer. That does at not least look like you gotta it's... let the ingredients cook together. I mean, you can't just take the cutlet, pour some sauce on it, put the cheese on, and let it melt for a minute and be good to go. Speaking of Italian food, we got a big day on Sunday. Yeah, big day. Easter what do you got? What's on the menu? What's on the menu? Easter Sunday. Uh, I'm gonna say Monagot. Oh, uh, that's what I got on the menu. Yeah. Um. Eggplant parm? Uh, I don't know about that. Chicken parm? I'm not a big am- egg. I'm not a big eggplant parm guy. Well, no, eggplant- I, you know, I think eggplant rollatini is better than eggplant parm. Yeah, I- I'm just not a big egg- eggplant guy. What about the emoji? I love it. Yeah. Uh, the you, you lag there. You just it looked like you just blank stare after oh. I said that. What else you got on the filet? Menu? Filet mignon. Wow. Filet mignon. Look at that. Ma- maybe some lamb chops. All right. What time? What, what, what should I bring? Bring a bottle of wine. What, what, what well, do you, you don't have to bring anything. You're good. We'll come by. We're um we're we're going out for Easter actually. Just the fam. No. The four of us. We're going to a restaurant. Hell yeah. No, don't say no. I'm I'm hyped up. No. Ma- mail it in. That yeah, seems like mail it in. Mail in. No, no. We're, we're good. I don't we don't have to worry about cleaning up and hey, come come by. Yeah, I'll see you after. Come by after you're done for dessert. Uh, I'll come for dessert. What are you eating? Oh nuns again. Why are you so calm this eating on air thing now? You don't like it? I mean it's like it's very Craig Carton ish. It is. And I was actually doing a morning show a couple weeks ago. And one of our sponsors, the radio station, brought us breakfast. Pantano's does bagels. They brought us all these crazy sandwiches. So I'm sitting there munching on the mic. The greatest ASMR you can you can have. Uh, it's not needed. People love all. that. People uh, love that. 
tweet from Brian Hawk Hotch. Never will be able to say his name right. Hoke Hotch Hawk or Hotch. Um, it's Hotch. Vladimir Guerrero Jr. last night, four for four, three homers and a double. Vladimir Guerrero Jr. tonight, 0 for four, four strikeouts. If that doesn't describe baseball in, in one tweet, then I don't know what will. Yeah, 100%. 100%. Yeah. Uh, baseball, we got anything else on the agenda, Michael? My Metsies look pretty good. I don't want to spend too they much do look time Mark, on them. Is Mark Canna the savior of New York? I'll tell you something about Mark Canna. I love Mark Canna. Yeah. And I, this this might sound like a hot take. My favorite player on this team right now is Eduardo Escobar. Yeah. I love this guy. Yeah. He's the, he's a guy that, that fans are going to like. He's bats from both sides of the plate. He can play multiple positions. He, he, he drives in a lot of runs. He's getting on base. Mm-hmm. I think his walk rates in the first week is like 30%. That's what you want. He's just getting on base. Tyler McGill looks like a, a savior with this DeGrom injury. But you, by the way, if you want an actual prediction and not my pessimistic prediction of DeGrom's never pitching another start for the Mets, I think the All-Star break. Which is fine if you got Sylor McGill in there as his replacement. Uh, no, relax. Yeah, and, he, he does look and, good. Uh, and Chris Bassett, who we're going to see tomorrow, he he looked very good in his – amazing in his first start, actually. So I'm um, excited to see him to, uh, tomorrow as well. Ready to rock. Cookie Carrasco Ready to rock. pretty good. Yeah, that oh. was very surprising. By the way, Taiwan Walker, what what's with the hair? He looks like an idiot. I mean, what else? I mean, what else we got? He looks like an idiot. He's got to chill with that. I mean, how does the hat even stay on? I hope it falls off. I I hope that he comes back from injury and he's okay. He has a start where it's a windy day and the hat falls off and he's got to chase that and nobody should help him. With the drama. Always you with the drama. Oh, how do you like Phillies fans chucking iPhones on in the left field? You know what? Those people have serious problems. Okay, I had a woman screaming at me. Good. Like my age, too. Yeah. Screaming at me because I was cheering for my team. Just how did last night go the night after the Mets blew a four-run lead in the eighth? And I turn around and I go, it was terrible. This is a different game. And we won. Edwin Diaz locked the save down. Uh, Stop. Play the trumpets. I can't wait to hear the trumpets tomorrow. Mm. Better hear the trumpets tomorrow. Home opener, right. baby. What time's the game? Home opener. One o'clock, but I got to be there at 10. Oof, gate's open. Tom, no. Tom Seaver statue unveiling at 1030. I'm going to see. Oh, very, very I'm classy. Gonna... Not very really. Classy like... the Mets. Tom Seaver day on Jackie Robinson day. Love it. Really yeah. nice, guys. Guy's also been dead for like two years, as if he hasn't been the face of the whole franchise for 50 years. We finally decided to give him a day. This is the Wilpons fault. Mm-hmm. Again, their fault. Whatever. I'm going to see Steve Cohen in person for the first time tomorrow. And Tia, what's her name? Tia Alex. Aunt, Aunt Alex, his wife. Can't wait. Aunt Alex. Oh, stop. Please stop. Tia Alex. Yes, that's her name on Instagram. I follow her. Oh, so weird. You guys so, are so weird. In person. You got a weird fan base. Cannot wait. I mean, my fan and base sucks. Wait. Everybody's <laughs> over dramatic and an idiot, but like, why are you calling now? Nah, we're just weirdos. And, you guys are weird. Uncle and Aunt Steve. I also, right. you know, I got a problem. I got a bone to pick with Mets fans. Okay. Because Please. you're talking about this thing with the Phillies fans and they're they're too over the top and everything. I saw yeah, a TikTok. Iconic. Of some guy walking out of the Philly Stadium, he's like, I'm never coming back to Citizens Bank Park. I don't know if you saw this. He was like, the, we, we just left. My dad got beer spilled on him. Here's evidence. And he, like, turns the camera. The dad, it looked like he got, like, drizzled raindrops on his shirt. Like, I was expecting the shirt to be soaked and, like, you know, destroyed. And he had, like, little droplets of beer on him. He's like... They spilled beer on us. And he's like, this is a joke. I'm never coming back. You guys are ridiculous. All you Phillies fans are the same. I'm like, come on, man. 
See, if you don't start with them for the most part, you don't have an issue. I I thought it was going to be like, you remember the Yankees wild card game against the A's in like 2018? That one A's fan got like doused in beer. Like literally yes. they dumped the can on the guy. This was probably the end of the day and they were like, yeah, and they cheered and there was like a little, little beer spilled out and splashed onto the guy's shirt. And this guy wants to go on TikTok. Right and cry about it and say that he's never coming back to Citizens Bank Park. Good. Don't go back to Citizens Bank Park. That's crawl, unfortunate. It's a nice ballpark. Why don't you go in your house, crawl into your basement, and watch the Mets games with nobody else around, and, you know, that's it. Also, I'll, I just saw him as a fan right now. He doesn't need to go back to it. Citizens Bank's a beautiful park. I've been, he doesn't have to go else. back. But... He's not wrong. Those people are psychotic. There's no doubt about it. Oh, Philly's Braves. I mean, imagine when I was like 11, wearing a Jason Hayward Braves jersey. It's mm. a good choice. I'm sure, you got cursed at. I'm sure somebody cursed at you. I said hello to Gary and Keith Hernandez because my seats were right. Nice seats. Hall of Fame club at Citizens Bank Park. They were right below where all the press, the press box and the broadcasters were. So the, the broadcast table closest to us was Gary and Keith. So I wave up, Keith leans over. He goes, Hey, how are you? I'm like, Keith, what's up? And then Gary, the same thing. And I'm like, Gary, oh my God, it was amazing. I you're like, Oh, men. you're the guy from coin galleries of voice to bay. Yes, exactly. Yeah. You're the guy from that Seinfeld episode, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, right. crap, I was just about to say something to you. That's what I say when I see Buck Joel Walter. I'm like, Oh, you're the guy from Seinfeld that wants to do the cotton jerseys. Ah, <laughs> oh, what was I gonna say? It's out of my mind. We're talking about Citizens Bank Park getting cursed. Out. Imagine though, imagine like you're sitting there, you lose a game, somebody's videotaping you, and you have the need to rip his phone out of your hand and throw it on the field. You have problems. Yeah, I mean that that's a little overboard, no doubt about anger. it. Anger, anger management is needed for mm. every Philadelphia fan. Screw the Eagles. Oh, no, you're a closeted Eagles fan. What are you talking about? Apparently, that's what people say. Yeah. What are you Dale eating? Uh, let's go. Those, those regular or peanut? You think I'm eating peanut M&Ms? Oh, wait, wait. Are you still allergic? I'm not allergic to peanut butter. I'm allergic to tree nuts, but I don't like peanut butter and chocolate. Oh, oh. no. Nah, peanut m yeah. It's not peanut butter. It's just chunks of peanuts. That's disgusting. That's actually disgusting. Okay. Yeah, sure. There's something over there. I don't know what it is, though. It's a different color, but I don't want them. Getting picky. Yeah. I want ice cream. I got those. I didn't get uh, that either. I got those, like, cups with the little, like, cherry on top from Marshall's. Oh, yeah. Come over and get them. You want one? Leave them outside. I'll come come by. I had one more thing to talk about. We're talking about baseballs. I go, do we cover this? Oh, no, I'm waiting for you. I don't know. It's whatever. I'm I'll bring break it up and talk the, about. I'll bring it up in the next segment or something. Yeah, talk about NBA basketball. Don't really we, do that we here. We do have to talk about NBA basketball. Playoffs coming up, though. My boy Kyrie and KD on to the next round. Any update with the Yankees? You want, you want to give a championship prediction when we come back? Sure. I, I think we should do that. So do I. Oh, you know who mine is. All right, we're going to take a break. We're going to come back, break down the NBA playoffs, and give a prediction after this. Episode 61, we are back. The Hardline Sports Talk. I'm Michael Merlo. I'm with John Michael Masiri. Fun baseball segment, but we're done over there. We're going to head over to the NBA now as the playoffs have kind of started. The play-in tournament started, and it's almost over. And the first round of the NBA playoffs will start this weekend, which is pretty exciting. But, um... We have little predictions here, maybe some bold predictions who we like to make a run and ultimately a champion and a championship pick. Championship and a championship pick. There we go. Oh boy, got it out. Um, so the Nets, obviously, they're the biggest surprise. Brooklyn Nets, who are 44 and 38, they had to play in a playing game. They did beat the Cavs, so they are the seventh seed, and they're going to play Boston on the western side, the, the Timberwolves. With a seven seed, they beat the eight seed Clippers. So they're the seven seed. They are playing 
the Grizzlies, and now the Clippers and the Pelicans will play each other for the eighth seed in the playoffs, and the Hawks and the Cavs will play each other for the eighth seed in the East. So what do you think of my Brooklyn Nets here playing going up against uh, the Boston uh, Celtics? Uh, uh, what do you mean your Brooklyn Nets? I'm a Brooklyn Nets fan. I hate this kid. Um, well, what I think yeah, about I'm with a... your, I want why you why are you a Nets fan, Merla? You know, you like you like their jerseys, or is it the the two future Hall of Famers that they have in their in the starting lineup? Is that it? No, I, I like Brooklyn. It's got mm-hmm. some good pizza, mm-hmm. so I um I'm a fan of Brooklyn. Okay, um, I think this is a series. I mean, honestly, I could go either way. Uh, the Celtics have been like the hottest team in basketball, basically. Um, but you know, we, we know about the nets and, and it, it's go time for them. I mean, it's going to be a failure if they don't get the championship out of this, uh, four year window that they have, uh, and it's coming to a close soon. So I think it goes seven. Um, I could go either way. I think ultimately the, the, uh, the Celtics probably come out on top. Oh, you're a chalk eater. Just because they're they're playing. How am I a chalk? I feel like chalk eater would be the Nets because oh, it's the Nets. No, you're going with the you're going with the two seed. Well, yeah, they're the two seed for a reason. They're a good basketball team. I'm going with the seventh seed. Yeah. Bias because now die hard. I'll give you this. They get bounced out in five games to the Bucks in the second round. You're high on the Bucks, aren't you? You want my championship pick right here? Yeah, sure. Milwaukee Bucks beat the Phoenix Suns again. Again. But let me give you a team in the West that I really like. I really like the Mavericks as long as Luka plays. He's he's probably going to miss game one. Sorry. This dude with all the Chapman just walking people. Oh, God. No, he he likes throwing strikes. Mm -hmm. I like the Mavericks in round one. They're going to win round one. I don't think that's a problem. They will beat they will beat the Jazz. Oh, the Jazz are a great team. I think they'll beat the Jazz. And Donovan Mitchell will force his way out and come to Brooklyn. That's fine. But I do okay. think that if Luka Doncic is healthy, they can not only go to the Eastern, the Western Conference Finals, but give the Suns a run for their money a little bit. Okay. Um, my bold prediction out of the West, I think the Nuggets – Make it to round two. Okay, I think the Warriors. I like that actually. I I think I I actually agree with you. I think I think they'll beat the Warriors. I think the Warriors get bounced. Um, overrated. Yeah, honestly, it's kind of hard. I would love to go against you and and spice it up a little bit, but it's kind of hard to make a prediction for this uh, final without saying what you said, Bucks, Suns. I mean, obviously, I could see. The Bucs are the three seed, so I could see the Heat or the Celtics making it, but I think the Bucs are the more experienced team. They have the best player in the league. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I see them making it. Um, Memphis, we'll see. They're an exciting team. Uh, I, I, you know, I think we've seen that, you know, does experience matter a, a whole lot? I just brought it up about the Bucs, but the Suns made it last year, and they didn't have a ton of experience. You know, they got – DeAndre Ayton and Devin Booker, two young guys who haven't been around for a while and been in the playoffs for a while. But the Suns look like they're destined to make it back to the finals, and I could honestly say the same thing about the Bucs. I think the Sixers are going to be interesting, though. They definitely can make this thing interesting. Because, Well, actually, you know, talk about Philly fans. We were doing that before. Um they are upset with James Harden already. I mean, they, they are, and he has not played well. So not a good situation over there for, I mean, a long, I mean, they didn't commit long-term to him. They didn't give up too much to get him, but I would, I would be surprised if they gave him a long-term extension past this upcoming season and, and beyond. But I think they're a little unhappy with this play as of late down the stretch. We'll see how this you know, comes to, a, you know, if it 
comes to a head in the postseason if he just turns it on. But we've never seen this guy turn it on in the postseason. So if he was struggling toward the end of the regular season, how could you expect this guy to, you know, be the same player? Yeah, I mean, how can you give James Harden a long-term extension after what he's he's done, you know, over the past couple of years, especially this year with the, you know, the being unhappy in Brooklyn and, you know, he's been banged up a little bit and his – Oh, 100%. His performance has dipped slightly. Um, I don't know how you could go out and give a long-term contract to him right now. I mean, and no then way. when he gets up when he gets upset, he forces his way out. Mm-hmm. So that's not a good situation for the 76ers. And but they just got over ahead. They just yeah, good. <laughs> Roll this chime and walking the bases loaded. Um oh, good. Yeah. I can't, this is why I just I don't trust this guy as our closer. I really can't do it anymore. Um, and the, you know the Sixers just dealt with that whole situation with Ben Simmons. I don't think they want to go through something similar to that again. Oh, by the way, Ben Simmons could be back for Brooklyn Nets Game Four. Why well, you got a smile on your face? I can't wait to see my boy Ben in action. Come on your boy the dream the dream would be a 76ers nets i guess it would have to be eastern conference finals what makes ben simmons your boy just asking no i'm kidding i don't like ben simmons i'm oh, just, okay. he's on my team so no no he doesn't like i'm him. saying my boy your team remember when you were a lakers fan or when you were actually back on the knicks a little bit last year like a slight amount Wow, they, like took Chapman Chapman out. Out. they took Chapman out. Good. That's good. Quick trigger, Aaron. Yep. Good job. I like three, that. Three walks, you're done. Michael King coming in the game. Michael King, the Lord Savior. Yes, he is. Hopefully. Um, so that's our little NBA playoff preview. So I got the I got a wager on the Bucks to win the championship. So they better do this thing. And they're the favorite in the East. They should take care. I mean, the East should be a cakewalk for them. A cakewalk. Mm-hmm. I think the um, difficult part is going to be getting past the Suns. But I think you can do it again. The one thing who's I just stop, don't like about the, the NBA playoffs, I just can't – I can't stand the length of it. Oh, yeah, it's, it's so it's long. long, man. Like, do we really need seven-game series in the first round? No, of course not. Oh, it's, it's April 14th, so it starts, what, the, the 16th? What are we going to mid, – mid-June? We're going we're yeah, to keep going over the playoffs. We're going to yeah, two months. That's brutal. It's brutal. It's like it's almost like its own other season. It's too much. I mean, I think LeBron deserves some. I mean, I know we give LeBron all the credit in the world, but God damn, man, this guy's in the playoffs every yeah. season except this one. I mean, we love playoff basketball, but at some I'm point, I'm the biggest diehard basketball much. fan out there. Oh yeah, but I give my left <laughs> leg for playoff basketball. Right, exactly. Yeah, this is we're joking, by the way. We, you know, I'll watch, I'll watch, but the you Mets know, come first. If the you'll Mets find me done. dead before you find me watching like Grizzlies Timberwolves game one, there's no way, but right, I gotta be out in the bar drunk and it's gotta be the only thing on, right? And I'll say, Oh, look at this game, I'm, I'm watching, I'm bored, yeah. First exactly. half kid, maybe throw some, chuck some bones on, making it. Yeah, exactly, exactly, yeah. exactly, exactly. All right, that that's enough basketball talk. Well, we'll talk about it with the championship. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. We'll give updates every round. We'll see how our predictions are going. But um, that's gonna do it for this. We didn't talk about an Aaron Judge extension, which I kept forgetting to ask you about. Um, eh, but we'll okay. do it another time. Um, and well, next next episode we'll definitely be covering the NFL draft. Two weeks from right now, yeah. I mean, well, by the time this episode comes out, it'll be 13 days, but two weeks from now, first round. So, if I'm correct, we'll be doing that. What you would do a mock draft. Um, oh, accidentally clicked on Siri. Let me just go on my handy dandy calendar quickly. Mm-hmm. I'm guessing a mock draft would be done. We'll do it. We'll have it out Monday or. The 27th, on so like the Monday or Tuesday. Huh. Yeah. Okay. That's it. I'm excited for the mock draft again. Yeah. Mock drafts are fun. I got to do some research. Uh, both of our teams have uh, you know, four combined first round picks in the top 10. So that's exciting. Oh, yeah. 
Oh, two, Michael King just coming in, pumping strikes. Let's go. To uh, George? George Springer. He's got to face right. Springer, Bichette, and Vlad. Thank you, oh, Chapman. That, yeah. That sounds fun. Chapman, Walton. all right. Uh, whatever. Hey, you go watch that. Mm-hmm. And we'll talk later. Yes, we will. All right. We'll talk to you guys. Episode 62 coming out next week.